welcome to the MJ Theory. Yeah! You want to see who's there? Watch. Hello to all my moonwalkers, my moonstalkers. Welcome back to another episode of the MJ Theory. Welcome, 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 welcome. This is going to be part two to the Vindication Day special. And this is the episode, ladies and gents, where shit goes down. It's about to go down. I'm going to go through everything that was going on, that went on in the opening statements. And if you haven't seen part one where I go through Tom Stennon and Tom Mezra's opening statements, please pause this video, check yourself, get a snack, and go watch that episode. It's chock full of funnies. No one is safe from my commentary. Go check it out. Go give it a listen. Give it a watch. And come back here and see what else I have in store for you. Because guys, when I tell you that the things that Tom Snedden says are absolutely ridiculous and Tom Mesro is just the snarkiest man around, I'm not kidding. And I also go into Martin Bashir. I go into more I go more into Janet Arvizo. I go into how Tom Snedden planted evidence. <laughs> You heard that correctly, ladies and gentlemen. He planted evidence. So if you want to hear about all of this and more, we'll get into it right now. Here is where I break it all down for you. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. So Tom Snedden opened his whole, well, he didn't open his opening statement, but he opened the... Um, the, the, all of the, uh, where he was talking about the indictments and this and that and what have you. He opened it by saying that the case began with 10 year old cancer stricken Gavin Arvizo. <laughs> that is not correct. But in reality, it began with a piece of shit tabloid journalist named Martin Bashir. Boo, you stink! Well, he's not a tabloid journalist, but the way that he did the Michael Jackson interview, he may as fucking well be a tabloid journalist. And Martin Bashir, I pray to God that you are listening. So Martin Bashir was an up-and-coming journalist in Britain. Basically, he finagled his way into Michael's life using Yuri Geller as a middleman. Now, Yuri Geller was a magician who Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, who Martin Bashir uh, figured could get the connections that he needed to Michael, and, and sure as shit, uh, he was able to. Um, he told Yuri that he could help Michael's dreams to establish an international children's day and his plans to meet the secretary general of the UN, uh, Kofi Annan. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these names correctly. Um, in order to help fight AIDS in Africa. So Geller arranged the meeting between Martin and Michael. And it's at this time that Martin tells Michael that he had done an interview with Princess Diana, whom he knows Michael just adored. And then showed him a crumpled up shitty letter allegedly written by Diana singing Martin's praises and thanking him for the wonderful work he did on her interview in 1995. Now, Michael agreed to do this interview, which is unfounded. Michael did not do interviews. And it's because he knew. He's been in this industry long enough to know that the interviewers and editors can cut, snip, chip, chat, patty whack, all these different things that he's saying to form their own narratives and their own conclusions, which is exactly what happened in this interview. But Michael agreed to do it under a few conditions. The first is his faces, his children's faces would not be shown on camera. And we all know that that was not done. Michael was terrified of his children being kidnapped, abducted. He didn't want a Lindbergh baby. But the baby was covered so they couldn't see the baby yeah, because I, you don't let anybody don't see let, the children. I don't want, no. I don't so want therefore, a Lindbergh baby. Somebody no. took Lindbergh's baby, Charles Lindbergh's baby, took him in the forest and burned him to death. Okay, so I don't want that to happen to my children. So I put veils over them. I don't want people seeing them. Because the press, are, they can be very mean. I don't, I don't want them to grow up psychologically crazy because of the evil things they could say to them. I want them to be normal. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, it does. The second condition was he would get a chance to review and edit the documentary before the footage aired. And I don't have to tell you what happened with that one. And the third is that all profits would go to charity. Um, except Yuri wanted a kind of like a finder's fee for connecting the two and all that. Um, and, you know, and let's not let's not lie and kid ourselves. Michael's image in the early 2000s really, really did need a boost. I can wholeheartedly understand why he would want to do such an in-depth interview like the one Martin sold him on. Only that's not what Martin wanted to show the world. That's not what Martin wanted. Martin wanted to establish himself even more as a journalist after having already done Diana, uh, Princess Diana. And now he wants to, to represent Michael Jackson in this interview. And he in no way, shape, or form wanted to help Michael Jackson with this interview. He wanted to paint the narrative that the world had about him since 1993 and really, really shove it out there in people's faces that Michael was this weird, eccentric, kitty-loving, kitty-touching person, which he was not. And Martin used yellow journalism to sell that whole thing. And yellow journalism is essentially when, basically, in layman's terms, it's when you don't produce what you're selling. You use all these big captions and these big, oh, it's, it's clickbait. It's, 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 it's what clickbait is today. And so Michael actually ended up suing Martin Bashir. But I'll, I'll get more into all of the Martin. I have a whole episode planned just on Martin Bashir and his ridiculousness. Um, it should also be noted that Martin forged Michael's signatures on contracts then I do have some photo evidence to show. And anybody who sees this picture knows that that's not Michael Jackson's signature. That's not his signature in any world that we live in. So in the documentary, Martin paints a horrendous image of Michael, asking him loaded questions that could be altered in editing using B-roll footage to mask the edits and the sound bites. Now, B-roll, for those who don't know, and I'm in this industry, so I understand B-roll and people use B-roll for all kinds of things. Now, B-roll is, it's, it's when someone's in an interview and they cut away to something really quick. They cut away to uh, an exterior shot or they cut away to, um, to archive footage, you know, um, while the talking is still um, continuing underneath it. So B-roll is commonly used to mask edits, audio edits. Now, you, when, when, you're, when you're editing somebody's interview, especially if it's a video interview, you can't let the video of the interview continue because it'll be all choppy and all over the place. But when you use B-roll, the, the edits are smooth and the audio seems genuine. And anybody who's seen the Living with Michael Jackson interview, it is primarily B-roll footage. A lot of it. And B-roll as well of Martin Bashir just staring at Michael while he's answering his questions. That's B-roll. When the edited footage is any anything other than who's speaking while they're speaking, B-roll. Okay, now cue the music and that star thing. Boom. So the part of the documentary I'll be focusing on for obvious reasons is the part with Gavin Arvizo. They've stayed in your bedroom? Done, well, so, very few. But, you know, some have. And they say, is that really appropriate for a man, a yeah. grown man, to be doing that? How do you yeah, respond yeah. to that? I feel sorry for them because that's judging someone who wants to really help people. Why can't you share your bed? The, the, the most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. You, know? really, you really think that? Yeah, of so course. You're taking a position that you use yeah. every single night that you go into, you sleep. And you're sharing it with another. You say you can and have my bed if you want. Sleep in it. I'll sleep on the floor. You can. It's yours. I always give the best to the company. You know, like to him. I said, because he was gonna sleep on the floor. I said, no, you sleep in the bed. I'll sleep on the floor. Martin did not include the part where Michael says he slept on the floor with Frank Cassio, again also known as Frank Tyson. Gavin came to Michael and said, Michael, could we sleep in your room tonight? And Michael, Michael looked at me and says, I don't know, you know, I think you better ask your mother. Oh, we already asked our mother. She says, sure, no problem. 
I'm like, no, this is some, something's odd. This is not right. And then as I was about to go tell Gavin that he cannot sleep in Michael's room, Michael says, okay, I have a solution for this. You have to sleep in the room with me. The two children slept on the bed and Michael and I slept on the floor. He made it seem like this was some intimate night between <laughs> Michael and Gavin, which it wasn't. And after the release of the Martin Bashir documentary in the UK on February 3rd, 2003, and then the United States released three days later on February 6th, a school official at the school that the Arvizos attended notified de the Department of Child and Family Services and requested that they investigate Michael because they thought it was a little sketch. And of course, who wouldn't the way that Martin Bashir fucking edited that documentary? Now, February 14th through February 27th of 2003, February 14th through February 27th of 2003, remember those dates, social workers interviewed the Arvizo family, okay? And all of them, all of the Arvizo kids and the mom and the dad all maintained that Michael never acted inappropriately around them. Janet said the children had never been left alone with Jackson. Janet said the children never slept in the same bed as Jackson. And according to the report, the investigation by the sensitive case unit concluded all of the allegations of neglect and sexual abuse to be unfounded, end quote. Another complaint was launched when media psychiatrist Carol Lieberman filed a complaint with the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department in February of 2003. She asked for Michael to be investigated and also demanded that his children be removed from his custody using bubbles as a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> she said and i quote bubbles the chimp is reportedly now living in an animal sanctuary one would wonder and how and why that came about if mr jackson is unable to take good enough care of his pet chimp should you be concerned for his children end quote um no bitch <laughs> you shouldn't do you know how many dogs my family has taken, like, to the shelter or, or taken or given away or sold because we either couldn't take care of them or they were really misbehaved dogs and they needed to go to a home that was better suited, which was the case for Bubbles? If that's the case, then uh, my parents should have been investigated years ago. <laughs> I, am, I am in danger. <laughs> um, and Lieberman also noted about the boy in the documentary, Gavin, there was an unmistakable sense that something sexual had occurred with the boy as evidenced by his body language and his submissive demeanor towards Michael, end quote. Now, this bothers me so much because they're holding hands and Gavin has his head on Michael's shoulder. And I would do that all the time with my parents when I was little. They didn't molest me. Uh, and, and, and even um, during the rebuttal tape that the Arvizos filmed um, with um, Hamid, Hamid Moslehi, who was Michael's private videographer, um, you'll remember him from the um, Living with Mike, not Living with Michael Jackson documentary, but the, um, the, the rebuttal video uh, with uh, Maury Povich, Hamid Moslehi did all the behind the scenes footage for Michael's cameras. Um, when the Arvizos did their rebuttal tape with Hamid, even Janet made a point in saying, oh, oh, she didn't think the cameras were rolling. She was like, oh, make sure you get a shot of me and Gavin holding hands because me and Gavin are holding hands right now. And we didn't plan that. That just, it's natural. It happens when you're with a parent or with Michael, who was a father figure, you know, blah, blah, blah. She even defends Michael in that way. And she had no idea the cameras were on. Hey, you know how Bashir zoomed in on, on him holding yeah. hands? Yeah. Do that the I'll same that thing. Because, you know, because, because well, that's what a mother and uh, like, does with a son does. or a father does with a son, you know? Yeah. And they try to make it out to see, be something wrong and dirty. So the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department investigated uh, and closed the case on April 16th with no further action required. And their report cites interviews with the family that were conducted by three Los Angeles social workers. And according to the alleged victim, Michael is like a father to me. He's never done anything to me sexually, end quote. And he added that he never slept in the bed with Michael, end quote, and that his mother was always aware of what goes on in Neverland, end quote. Janet told social workers that Michael's like a father to my children. He loves them, and I trust my children with him, end quote. 
She also said he had never been anything but wonderful. My children have never felt uncomfortable in his presence. Michael has been a blessing, end quote. Davelin also defended Michael, saying, Michael is so kind and loving, end quote. Now, on February 20th, 2003, the Arvizo family participated in that rebuttal tape shot by Hamid Moslehi, like I was talking about, set to be released in tandem with the documentary produced by Michael, hosted by Maury Polvich, titled The Footage You Were Never Meant to See. I'm sure most of you are aware of the recent television special that claimed to give an honest, candid, and revealing look into the private life of one of the world's most successful and controversial celebrities, Michael Jackson. The revelations were explosive. The ratings were enormous. But Michael has claimed that what TV journalist Martin Bashir presented was a twisted and edited construction of scandal and innuendo, not a true representation of the interviews that actually took place. In the next two hours, we're going to give you an opportunity unprecedented in the history of television. We're going to show you footage that was never intended to be broadcast. Tonight, the private video from Michael's own cameras. Cameras that shot the Michael Jackson interview. The footage you were never meant to see. Now, the, the importance of this documentary cannot be said enough. Martin Bashir was slapped in the face with this. Hi, I'm with the Port Commission. Yeah! Martin, if you're listening, you fool. Did you really think that you were going to get away with it? And honestly, I don't even think it was a matter of him thinking he was going to get away with it. Because one, you can't unring the bell. Once it's out there, it's out there and it won't stop. And Martin Bashir will forever be known as the guy who kick-started the, the Michael Jackson trial. Because let's face it, he is the one who kick-started the Michael Jackson trial with the way that he portrayed Michael in his shitty documentary. So there's that for you. And so the if you haven't seen... Um, the footage you were never meant to see, the Michael Jackson documentary, the rebuttal, the response to the Bashir documentary. Um, again, I implore, you, I implore you to watch that documentary. It is so important. And it, it really, um, you get to see what Michael was actually saying, how he really feels about things, his full thoughts, his complete statements. And when you, especially if you watch them one right after the other, which is what I did, they're two completely different narratives of Michael Jackson. So you'll come to your own conclusions. I already came to mind. Martin Bashir's a piece of shit. Pardon my French, but you're an asshole. What? Asshole! Uh, you are absolutely right, sir. You've hit the nail right in the head. The rebuttal tape made by the Arvizos was actually never released to the public because they, Janet, she wanted money for the rebuttal tape and Michael wasn't going to give it to her. Can we just talk? Oh, hell no! So we're going to move into the conspiracy charges now. The, and and what, what fueled the, the, um, the 28 overt acts of conspiracy was that rebuttal tape. Because the prosecution painted that rebuttal tape and all of the nice things that they were saying about Michael, that they were being forced to do so by Michael and his people to make Michael look good. Okay, I'm going to get into this. So the indictment included child abduction, false imprisonment, and extortion. Okay, the, the conspiracy indictments. And the prosecution for the trial alleged that Michael conspired with uh, Mark Schaffel, Ronald Knitzer, um, Dieter Weissner, um, who, what's his name? Vincent, uh, Vinnie, Vinnie Black, Vincent Amon, and... Um, Frank Tyson, who's also known as Frank Cassio. Now, Michael conspired with them to kidnap the family and force them into making positive statements about him. And they said Michael forced the family into making these statements so that he could prove, oh, excuse me, improve his public image after the airing of the controversial Living with Michael Jackson documentary, and then he molested Gammon. Okay? Michael's associates were, were accused, the, the aforementioned five people that I just named, but they were never charged or indicted. Okay? They, because they would have been um, breaking the law too. They would have been committing felonies as well. But they were never charged. Thomas Nenna didn't care about them. Oh! 
Legal experts claim that this is because Snedden may have threatened them with charges in order to tempt them to turn on Jackson. And Joe uh, uh, Tacopina, I think that's how you say his name, who represented two of the alleged co-conspirators, but don't know which ones, he says his clients were offered immunity if they agreed to testify against Jackson. And both men refused Snedden's offer and denied the family's allegations. Okay? So let's break this down. During the summer of 2003, okay, Snedden was informed by psychiatrist Stan Katz who, like I said earlier, Larry Feldman, the man who also represented Evan Chandler, he was initially going to use Stan Katz during the 1993 allegations before it settled out of court. Stan Katz told Tom Snedden that private investigator Bradley Miller, who was working for the defense, was in possession of the tape that the accuser and his family made for Michael, and on it they were praising Michael, which was obviously a huge blow to the prosecution's case. Okay? So the tape of the family praising Michael was made in February, early February, which, no, not early February, like mid-February, which directly contradicts the family's initial claim that Jackson had kidnapped them and molested the boy that same month. So when Snedden learned that about the tape, Snedden raided Miller's office, took the tape, and viewed it. Okay, and these actions violated Jackson's attorney-client privileges because Miller was working for Tom Mesro. And his defense team. Okay? And this isn't the first time Snedden's done some foolishness during this case, but I will get to that. Tom Snedden knew that Michael's entire defense strategy was going to be how the Arvizos, the Arvizos denied any claims of sexual, sexual assault on tape. And in um, two or three other interviews with DCFS, yes, DCFS, um, and, um, social worker interviews and all this and that, they had denied claims of sexual abuse. And to discredit this evidence, he claimed that the family was coerced into making positive statements on Jackson's behalf so that the singer could improve his image after the Bashir documentary. This, this is the basis of the conspiracy charge brought down by the grand jury in April, 2004. Had Snedden not seen this tape, it very well could have been used to exonerate Michael. Instead, Snedden molded it and reshaped it and in order to paint that, that videotape as evidence of a criminal conspiracy. This guy was desperate for a conviction. Okay? And going along with this new strategy, the family later claims that everything they said on the tape was scripted and that they were whisked away to someone's house in the dead of night to tape it. Okay? And the family's story changed over the course of the entire investigation, initially claiming that Michael started molesting Gavin on February 7th of 2003, immediately after they returned from their trip to Miami, which was that same flight where they said Michael licked Gavin on the forehead and they all drank wine and shit. And, and I'll talk more about that in a second. And this is also recorded in the prosecution's initial felony complaint that Gavin claimed the molestation happened on February, February 7th of 2003. Okay. And that felony complaint was filed on December 18th of 2003. The Arvizos claimed that they told nice things about Michael during the DCFS interview occurring on February 20th because they were under duress and intimidated by Michael's people. However, with the emergence of the rebuttal video, which was also shot on February 20th, this claim became hard to defend. So the story later changed to the molestation happening only after February 20th, after the shooting of the rebuttal video. So that any and all claims made by the family during the DCFS interviews and CPS interviews and social worker interviews that Michael had never molested Gavin would be immediately made irrelevant. Oh, come on! So the news story was that they didn't tell the DCFS about molestation simply because no molestation had occurred yet. And by saying that the family was threatened, harassed, and kidnapped by members of Jackson's camp, Snedden now has a way to justify the fact that they were defending Michael before, during, and after the alleged abuse. Are you keeping up so far? Are, are, y'all, are y'all keeping up with this? Because I had to go through this a couple times myself. Who does Tom Snedden think he is? He's literally come, he's, he's making up stories. He's connecting dots that aren't there. How? 
And it's so obvious, you guys. And what pisses me off is that people who are so adamant that Michael was guilty of all these shit, especially these conspiracy charges, they don't take the time to read. You know what they do read? They read uh, these ridiculous um, magazine articles online. Oh, I read this or oh, I read that. Really? Well, let me refer you to the court transcripts where you will find all of the information necessary. But it's like they're too scared. They're too scared to go to these actual places where they know that they're going to find out the truth, but they're too scared to know the truth. You can't handle the truth. Anyway, so let's move on to false imprisonment, the false imprisonment charges. So when the Martin Bashir documentary aired in the UK on February 3rd, 2003, Michael and his people got hold of a typed transcript of the documentary and were mortified, mortified by its contents because obviously it's not what Martin had promised. And Michael didn't get any editorial rights on it like Mike Mike Martin promised. So all of this coming in, they were just flabbergasted by it. What is that? Oh shit, what? And the family claims they were immediately found by press and popos and at, at this point... And that they had no idea that they were even in a documentary, which I highly doubt. Like, like we said earlier in the Tom Mesereau, um, the Tom Mesereau opening statement. There's no way Janet didn't know. Janet knew exactly what was going on. Okay, and like I said, I'm in this industry. And when you're on set, when you're on a film set, especially if it's something as intimate as a traveling documentary, you're on a skeleton crew. You've got like six or seven people max helping you out with this and not including the people that you're interviewing and traveling with. You know what I mean? And when you're in that intimate of a setting, um, it's really not that hard to find out what the filming is for at all. Everybody loves to talk. Everybody, if you ever on a set, everybody talks either about the production they're currently on, the production they were on previously or the production they're about to be on. Everybody talks. And I'm pretty sure I'm not 1000% on this because I'm not a producer and I'm not, I don't deal with paperwork. Um, I'm, they probably had to sign something to be in that interview, be it an NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement, or perhaps a waiver saying that they give the production permission to be on tape, blah, 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 this and that, what have you. But given Martin Bashir's rec- recorded history of forging documents, I wouldn't be surprised if he either forged their signatures or mucked up the paperwork somehow or just skipped it entirely. So that would fall on him in that regard. But then, again, this is just a theory. The MJ theory. <laughs> <laughs> also, when Janet found out about the documentary, she asked for some money for it. Like I said, she wanted distribution rights because her son and her family were portrayed on the tape and she knew that she could make money off of that somehow. And of course, they weren't paid any sort of money. And what does this all remind you of? What does this remind you of? Does this remind you of something that might rhyme with M- Mevin Handler? <laughs> oh my God! So, you know, Major Jay Jackson who Janet was in a relationship with during all of this, he is quoted saying, Michael can give us a house. Michael can pay for college. Michael Jackson can pay for benefits. That's not enough. We want big money. And it's proven that he said this, okay? Michael and the Arvizos flew to Miami. I'm just going to jump over to this real quick. Michael and the Arvizos flew to Miami pretty much immediately after the documentary aired in the UK. And the prosecution says that this was to keep the Arvizos away from the documentary. They were forbidden from seeing it, barred from seeing it, and that they weren't allowed to see the footage at all. They were kept away from the TV base. Okay, and let's talk about this for a minute. So, you can imagine Michael was probably, well, he was extremely embarrassed when this documentary came out. And... It's very similar to when the 93 allegations came out. He was humiliated and he went to Mexico and he was traveling a lot. He just wanted to get away from California, away from where all of the the heat was. And and that's just how he is. He and, and remember, he he was in 2003, he was reliving a nightmare from 1993 a thousand times over. I wouldn't want my friends to see that shit on TV either. I would want to get the fuck out of California too. Okay, so I'm thinking because Janet did complain to Michael and she complained to the prosecutors that she was being harassed by media 
which is true. The, the, the media and the paparazzi are starving for some kind of story. And so when something breaks, especially when it was about Michael Jackson, they jumped on it. Okay. And so she, she had some of Michael's security personnel around her. Now she claimed later that the security personnel were around her because they were the ones who were falsely imprisoning her and making sure she didn't run off anywhere, blah, blah, blah. Cause she was a paranoid schizo, at least in my opinion. Um, but they were there because she requested them there. And I think if I remember correctly, Tom Nezro was able to prove that as well, but she requested those security to be there. And so she, and she was probably, and this is again, just a theory. She most likely probably betting the bottom dollar complained to Michael saying, oh my God, my kids are being harassed because the kids were being harassed. They were being made fun of in school because obviously everybody has access to the internet at this day and age. And when, when the Martin Bashir interview was released in the UK, the US got footage of it and it was online and kids were recognizing Gavin and, and calling him a fag and saying, oh, you're the boy who sleeps with Michael Jackson. Martin Bashir ruined this kid's life. Okay. He didn't just ruin Michael's. He ruined Gavin's life. He was 13, a little younger than that, a little bit, you know? Um... So I'm, I'm pretty sure that Janet went to Michael and said, oh my God, we're being harassed, can't take this. So Michael probably took him with them. And according to uh, documents, there was supposed to be some type of a press conference in Miami. Okay. And the press conference didn't end up happening. So either the press conference was a lie made up by Tom Snedden a uh, lie made up by Janet or the press conference was supposed to happen and it got canceled at the last minute. And what I'm thinking probably happened with that is if there was supposed to be a press conference, Michael probably wanted to do a press conference or maybe his people wanted to do a press conference and perhaps they pulled out of it at the last minute because they realized it's a little bit of a hasty reaction. We don't even know what our next move is. And they didn't. So they probably pulled out of that. Okay. And that's probably when, you know, they, they started hatching the idea about a rebuttal tape. But there's so many different stories about who came up with the idea about the rebuttal, rebuttal video. Um, so nobody's really sure. Um, so Tom Stedden paints Michael as not wanting the family to see the documentary as a bad thing. But like I said, um, obviously the family would have known that the footage was edited since they were there. Even if they had seen it. Okay? They were in the documentary. They would have known that what was being edited and what was being said was not true. So it's not like Michael's hiding the documentary from them because, oh my God, they're going to find out that they're, they're going to find out that I molested Gavin. It's like, what? Like if Michael molested Gavin, do you really think he's going to go up to Martin Bashir and go, Hey, get this on tape. I fiddled his diddle. And then do it one more time and skip away. Like what? No, everybody knew Everybody involved knew what was initially said in the interview, interviewing process, and how it was edited once it was produced and finished and released. So Tom Snedden's whole point of not wanting the family to see the documentary is ridiculous. Oh, you are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. What did Michael have to be afraid of? I mean, Michael was probably humiliated and embarrassed, so maybe that would be the only reason why. Okay, and then also diving back, because I, I did mention earlier that I was going to get into how Gavin, the, the adults had a lot more to do with this than Gavin and the kids, but Gavin probably had his own motivations to turn on Michael, and this is my theory. When the documentary was aired in the UK, obviously, like I said, the US media was still able to get a hold of some of the footage, and according to Janet, Gavin was horrendously teased and called gay and a faggot, like I said. And if that's true, then is anyone surprised that a 13-year-old boy would go along with a revenge plot to get back at the person they deem responsible as to why they were being bullied? No excuses whatsoever, but does that shock anyone? As to why he was so compliant? He's thinking like a 13-year-old boy. This, this is, this is, uh, snack time for, for these kids, you know, do, doing shit like this. And then knowing that they're probably going to get money at the end of all of this. I mean, what 13 year old wouldn't be on board, especially if they had a sudden vendetta against who used to, someone who used to be their friend, especially when a young boy is being called gay. Ha! Gay! They will find a way to get back at you really fast. 
So Gianna and the family claim that they were held hostage in February 2003. But throughout that entire month, the records show that they had numerous opportunities to ask for help, numerous shopping sprees. And a few examples, the two police departments that interviewed the family in mid-February, remember? February 14th through February 27th? Why did no one ask the police for help if they were there to investigate Michael Jackson, the man that they were being allegedly held prisoner by? Janet got into contact with Bill Dickerman, a civil attorney in February 2003. Why didn't she tell him to call the cops? Also, what kidnappers do you know that will willingly let their victims leave to visit their civil attorneys? Hello? Anyone? Anyone? The family went on several shopping sprees in February 2003 and in early March. And I read you all of, all of the receipts and all of the, the, uh, the totals of those shopping sprees, all of which I will remind you were billed to Michael. And on these shopping sprees, could they not have gotten help? Janet got her nails done. Couldn't have asked one of them for help? One of the nail people? Hello? Anyone? According to prosecution, the family was able to escape Neverland multiple times, but Michael was able to cajole them back. Why not go to the police the moment they escaped? And furthermore, why go back? <laughs> why? What is that? Janet's husband testified that the family was at his apartment with P.I. Brad Miller uh, when, they, when he interviewed them in February. Now, this is husband Jay Jackson, who then was her boyfriend. Now, why were, at, why, why were they at the stepdad's house when they were supposedly being kidnapped by Michael Jackson and his employees? Can anybody tell me? Michael Manning, Janet's divorce attorney, told reporters that Janet was still praising Michael in April 2003. April. So this would have been after the alleged kidnapping. See what I mean? So this... The whole thing about the false imprisonment was bullshit. And everybody who looked at the evidence, even jurors, there was no evidence of any kind of false imprisonment. And if she was really, truly being held hostage, why didn't she ask for help? Why didn't she, when she escaped the first time, why didn't she go get any help? Why? Like, like, it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. So now I'm going to jump right into the molestation allegations. This is what the Tom Sned, this is what Tom Sneddon is saying. Tom Sneddon is saying that Michael was, was grooming Gavin, that he, Neverland is just this whole grooming operation where he grooms little boys to molest them and he gives them alcohol and he gives them porn and all this and that. Have you lost your damn mind? Tom Sneddon is saying that on the first night that Gavin said, he said this happened twice. The first night of molestation, Michael inserted his hand into Gavin's underwear. And now this story changes. A lot. Whether or not he just rubbed Gavin over his undies, or if he slid his hand underneath his shorts, or if he slid his hand down from the top of the waistband down. Like, no, nobody knows. Not even Gavin or Star know how Michael got his, would have gotten his hand inside of their pants. Which is strange. Okay? And the other issue is that Star claims to have seen this entire molestation of his brother, because Star was the only witness to um, Gavin's alleged molestation. The issue is that Star claims to have seen this happening while ascending the stairs into Michael's bedroom. Okay? Video evidence taken at Neverland disproves this so hard. You cannot see anything. You cannot see a bed. You cannot see on top of the bed as you ascend the stairs because there's a big-ass desk obstructing the view from the stairs. Star would have had to have been standing at the top of the stairs where Michael would have been able to see him standing there, just chilling. 
And there's video proof of this. Okay, and they used it in trial, in the trial. And also, Michael's bedroom, there's an alarm on the door. Michael was very, very private. He always kept the shades drawn in the house. He did not like the possibility of a paparazzi person breaking into the house, taking pictures of him, taking pictures of his kids. He liked to know who was coming up the stairs. If somebody was coming into his room, he, uh, he treasured his privacy. So he had this alarm on his door. And Starr couldn't even correctly, it, during the trial, he couldn't even correctly um, imitate the sound of the alarm. Like, did it go boop, boop, like a 7-Eleven, or did it go ding? Like, like he, couldn't, he couldn't figure it out, you know? And so, anyway, so Starr claims that he was able to just walk in the room. Nobody stopped him, and he was able to go in. And there's, and then he just walks up the stairs, he peeks up and he sees his brother being molested and then he just leaves <laughs> and goes back to his room. <laughs> I can't. Get out. Like, really? Is this the story that you're sticking to? <laughs> is this what it was? Oh my god. And that alarm is loud enough so that Michael would have been able to hear it from upstairs. So even if Michael or even if Gavin, well, I cannot talk. Even if Star had crept into the room all quiet like a church mouse, that alarm would have given him away. And if Michael had heard that alarm, do you really think he would have just shrugged it off and just continued fiddling the diddle? No, he would have stopped and like freeze, like, like. Oh, maybe if I don't move, you won't see me. Like that kind of thing, you know what I mean? Like, but Michael would not have just continued. There's so much wrong with this testimony. And Tom Mazzaro was able to disprove it. Boom, boom, boom. Easy peasy, you know what I mean? So the next time this supposedly happened, Gavin says that Michael masturbated him and then grabbed Gavin's hand and put his hand on Michael's dick and then Gavin pulled away and then that was the end of it. How about new, you crazy Dutch bastard? And another quick thing that I wanted to mention to you guys about the child molestation. And, and pedophiles in general. Because Tom Snedden, like I said in the last video, was painting Michael Jackson to be this horrible, horrible pedophile. This textbook child grooming pedophile. And like I also said, there was no evidence. No physical evidence. No, no proof. No nothing. But here's the thing. Pedophiles just can't help themselves. Criminals in general just can't help themselves. That's, that's mostly, if you, if you look at statistics, the most of the way that criminals get caught is because they talk too much. They even portray this shit in movies where the villain will go on and on about their dastardly plan and then they get busted, you know? So pedophiles cannot help themselves and, and the proof is in, you know, uh, people like Mark Salling, who I spoke on in uh, episode one and how he got caught with the child, with the child porn was he confided in an ex-girlfriend who for some reason he thought was going to get a real kick out of it. Like that's what, you know, got her moister than an oyster. If you're listening, Ashley Oddball, I'm a huge fan. No! <laughs> so that's how he got busted. And Jared Fogle, y'all remember Jared Fogle, the nasty subway dude? Blech. Gross. Uh, he got busted because he, his friend, he was on the phone with her and she recorded the entire conversation where he was talking about what he was going to do to these kids and how he got them to trust him. Just horrible, horrible, horrible things. And like I said before, like literally just a couple seconds ago, pedophiles can't help themselves. If Michael Jackson was a pedophile, if Michael Jackson had all of this porn that he was that that he had in his house that, that the 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 prosecution claims that that they were looking for which by the way they never found 
um, because it didn't exist, Michael Jackson would have shared it with at least one person. That's just human nature. That's just the way it goes. That's just how it is. That's how we are. When we do something bad, when we do something naughty, we can't help ourselves. We have to let somebody know. It's like a, it's like bragging rights. We're getting away with something. Oh my God. Oh my God. Like, I can't be the only person to know about this. We itch until we have to tell somebody, which I guess, like I said, that's how we get in trouble. So I digress. Moving on. These, these assholes in this trial couldn't even find DNA. And I'm going to talk to you guys about the only DNA fingerprint kind of thing that they found, but I'm going to talk to you about that because that one's a doozy. Okay. And then one of the things as well that I'm going to talk about is that Gavin said, like I mentioned earlier in the opening statements, Gavin said that Michael told him that masturbation is normal. If you don't masturbate, then a boy might grow up to rape a girl. Did you know that Michael never said that to Gavin? His grandmother did. And they proved that in court. Jordan fades back. Swoosh. And that's the game. Nothing further, Your Honor. His grandma is the one who said it. And then they just said that Michael was the one who told him. And then Gavin's on the stand like, oh, I, I, I must have, I, I don't know, I don't know, just, I, 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 stutter, ta, 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 today, Junior. Like, he was just flustered as shit. That you, um, you had, you, you, you could, you do. And then Gavin and, and Star claim that they saw Michael full on naked one time, just walking around butt ass naked in front of these kids. And their stories differ. They were together when this happened, but their stories are different. One of their stories is Michael sat down and said, oh, it's okay, being naked is natural, and sat there for like two minutes in the buff and then went back downstairs. The other story is that Michael just ran up really quick, grabbed something, and then ran back down. Now, this is interesting because when Tom Nazaro was cross-examining Gavin, he asked Gavin about Michael's vitiligo. And he was like, oh, well, you know that Michael puts on makeup because he's got patches on his skin, brown patches. And Gavin goes, oh, I didn't know he had brown patches. I just thought he was all white. All of us know, number one, that Michael Jackson absolutely had vitiligo. That is in his autopsy report. And I will show that to you as well. He absolutely had vitiligo. And we've all seen the pictures and especially in the behind the scene pictures of they don't really care. They don't care about us for that music video. His, he's got his shirt open, but I think for the video portion, the video portion that was released, I think they digitally removed those patches because I've looked for them in the videos and I can't find them. But in the behind the scenes photographs, they're there and they're prominent. You can see, it looks like, uh, he, he looks like he was just splashed with dirt or coffee or something. Like he, it, it's there. And if they had seen Michael naked, they would have seen that. And so that was one of the, one of the great things, the great, one of the greatest ways that Tom Ezra was able to disprove that the kids had, had never seen Michael naked. Number one, their stories didn't fucking match. And number two, they didn't know anything about his vitiligo. Gavin was just like, oh, I thought he was all white. Like, just shut up. Get out of here. You lie. So I do want to make sure that I talk about this before this video is over. And that is how Tom Snadden planted evidence. His evidence planning stupid ass. So there was the grand jury testimonies, right? And so Tom Snadden and Gavin, they're doing their, their, their grand jury uh, proceedings. And Tom Snedden has one of the magazines because one of the one of the um, indictments in one of the indictments, Tom Snedden says that Michael showed the kids porn and was using that to groom them, blah, blah, blah. And so Tom Snedden has a, a porn magazine and one of the um, same kinds with the same name on it. I think it was a Barely Legal or a Busty Ladies magazine. It was the same brand. And he hands it to Gavin. And he asks Gavin to thumb through the pages. And so Gavin's looking through the pages. And Tom Snedden goes, is this the magazine that you saw when you were at Michael Jackson's house? And Gavin goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, this, this is the same magazine. This is the same magazine. 
And then while Gavin's thumbing through the pages, one of the jurors in the grand jury goes, um, shouldn't he be wearing gloves? Because Gavin wasn't wearing any gloves. So now his fingerprints are all over this magazine. And Tom Sennon takes the magazine back and then immediately sends it for fingerprint analysis. And obviously, and this is one of the magazines from Michael Jackson's house. Okay, when they raided Neverland, um, this is one of the magazines that they pulled out of the house. Okay. And so later on in court, obviously they found, and when they did the fingerprint analysis, obviously they found Gavin's fingerprints and they found Michael's fingerprints on this magazine. But during the, the, the court, in, in court during the trial, when Tom Mesro is cross-examining Gavin, they've got a picture of the magazine up on this big screen, up on this projector. And Tom Mesro is asking Gavin, like, okay, so you said that this was the magazine, right? And Gavin goes, yeah. And Tom goes, Tom Mesro goes, this is the same magazine that Michael Jackson showed you when you were staying at Neverland. And Gavin goes, yeah, yeah, I remember this one. I remember it specifically. And Tom Mesro goes, what's the date on this magazine? What was the pub? When was this magazine published? The magazine was published seven months after Gavin left Neverland. So Tom Mesro is asking Gavin, like, how did this magazine, how were you able to see this magazine if it wasn't even printed until seven months after you left Neverland, and Gavin's just like, ah, oh, 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 oh. you could do so. You, you do. You could. Tom Sneddon planted evidence on the wrong, <laughs> on the wrong magazine. <laughs> you idiot! <laughs> oh my God! You can't make this up. Tom Sneddon was so desperate to get Michael's ass. It is so, it's, it's sad, really. That's just what it is. It's just sad. You are a sad, strange little man. And Tom Sneddon even, I, I don't remember if this was, I don't know why, I don't know why I didn't put this in my notes. I don't, I'm not sure if it was in the 1993 case. Tom Sneddon made a website encouraging anyone and everyone to come forward with whatever information they have on Michael Jackson. Tom Sneddon went worldwide looking for anyone to testify in 1993, okay? He went worldwide. He went to Mexico. He went to Australia. He went overseas. He went everywhere, which, mind you, is probably why this, the, the 1993 thing, cost so much money when it didn't even go to trial. He was desperate for a conviction. He was the DA. He wanted a big win, didn't get it, and then 2003 rolls around. He's able to get Michael Jackson. 2005 rolls around. It's so sad and it's so obvious. Okay, and like I said before, the people that, that Tom Sneddon got to testify against Michael all had something against Michael. They were wrongfully terminated employees or they felt that they were wrongfully terminated employees. Or they were people who have notoriously gone to tabloids previously to get money. Do your research. It is not hard to find this information, and I'm giving it to you on, on a platter. This whole trial is a goldmine, a wealth of information. And it's in here. And it sucks that hardly anybody is taking advantage of this information. Here, educate yourself! On June 13th, 2005, Michael Jackson was acquitted of all charges. And yes, he was acquitted. But in the court of public opinion, he was guilty. And that, I blame that on the thousands of media outlets that reported on this and only reported the prosecution side. This is the dangers of the media. And how important it is to not be sheeple and to do our own research. Because if we had done our own research back then and helped push the truth out, things probably would have been different. And I'm not excluding myself from that narrative either. We all could have done something. But what's important now is that we're getting the truth out. And we're... I mean, I... I sometimes feel like maybe it's too little too late. 
but I'm not ever going to stop. I'm never, ever, ever going to stop telling the truth about Michael Jackson because too many people have put, have taken out big smear campaigns on him. You know what? It's about time that we smear some other people. It's about time we smear Tom Snedden. It's about time we smear Janet Arvizo, Evan Chandler. Um, did I say Martin Bashir already? I'll say it again. Martin Bashir, Martin Bashir, Martin Bashir, because they are the ones who are lying. They are the ones who are manipulating the media. These are the ones who should have no right to speak publicly ever. And that is my humble opinion. I will say though, just because it gratified me so much, a couple of months after the 2005 trial ended, Janet Arvizo was indicted on um, and, and charged with welfare fraud after the trial. Yeah, but you know what sucks? She only got community service and some probation. That's some bullshit. There's no justice out here. But the jurors seriously hated her, man. They did not like Janet Arvizo up on the stand. They didn't. And speaking of the jurors, you know, they, a lot of them have done interviews and they talk and they, they say they would not, even today, they would not have changed their verdict. There was no evidence. And that was what all of them said. There was no evidence. Yeah, Tom Snedden was talking all this game. And honestly, let's be real. Tom Snedden's opening statement, I have expected M. Night Shyamalan to show up in the transcripts and say, written by M. Night. <laughs> like, you know, so many twists and turns and crazy shit. Like, it's a fan fiction is what it is. Got it. And, and I hope now... I hope that I've done my job correctly. I hope that after you listen to this, you're able to get a better understanding of what these charges were about, what was happening inside the courtroom. And I'm going to be going into this again in another video because if if I were to go through every single thing that happened inside that courtroom and, and um, bullet point every single thing that happened during the trial... Um, this video would last until next vindication day. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna have to make this a two-parter. And please comment, tell me, what do you want to know about? What are your questions that maybe I haven't answered yet or maybe left a little too vague for you guys? I want to know. So please, please, please leave me a message or a comment and and tell me or ask me and I, and I will figure it out for you. I promise. That's my job. That's what I'm here for. And can we please stop saying that there was child porn found inside of Neverland? There was no child porn found inside of Neverland. That is not true. The Santa, when, when that story came out, I think it came out in like 2016, 2017. And just to further prove this point, there was a photograph that came with that article that claims it was part of the, uh, of the, the, the child porn that was found. And it's even detailed in this article, that photo, the photos of a girl, a little girl, She's standing in a playroom and her undies are around her ankles and she's got pantyhose around her neck and she's like choking herself and uh, she's got makeup on and everything. And um, the article was saying that there was like kitty torture porn found and they described that photograph. That photograph was not printed until 2000 and until like 2015, I think, for some for some musician. And she, I think it's a she, she posted on her Instagram page using the, the original photo and the photo that they darkened and used for the article saying, um, unless they time traveled and got a copy of my picture, <laughs> I don't know how this ended up in the FBI files for the Michael Jackson trial, 1993. Um, you know, and, and the Santa Barbara Police Department released a statement saying that there were portions of their findings, which was the um, just the, the two uh, photographic essay books that I talk about in the other video, interspersed with shit from online. And somebody edited the two together and put it out online as if it was some actual article. And this is all stuff that you can find online, guys. It's not hard. Don't just read one article or two articles. Go oh, across the map. And if you can, go straight to the source. Santa Barbara Police Department, go straight to the source, the, 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 the court transcripts. 
And I was trying to get a copy of the, um, the 1993, um, court, not court transcripts, uh, the 1993, um, FBI findings, their whole file, but I had to request them. And because the way that goes online is you have to request all of these articles and then they give them to you in the order that they were received. And there's no way in hell that I would have gotten that in time, but I'm going to link the website to you below where you can request those articles and you can read them yourself. The whole point of Vindication Day, and what is so important to remember, and the only important thing to remember, and the brass tacks of everything, is that Michael Jackson was vindicated of all charges. He was vindicated in 2005, and I already prove, proven to you in my last video that the, the 1993 case was extortion. And everybody knows it was extortion. Oh, well, everybody who did the research anyway knows that it was extortion. There was absolutely no proof, no DNA evidence, nothing, 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 nothing that could pin child molestation on Michael Jackson in 2005. Nothing, and not even in 1993. Michael Jackson was vindicated. Michael Jackson was innocent. Always has been. Always will be. <laughs> Well, that does it for this episode, for this Vindication Day special. I really, really hope that you guys enjoyed it. This was a very, very, um, it was a difficult video to make and it was also a very easy video to make. Difficult because there's a lot of factual information involved and uh, easy because it's not hard to defend somebody who's innocent. So thank you guys so much for watching and for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And the next episode, I'm going to jump into someone that we all know about, uh, Shauna Mangatal. And whatever your opinions are of her, my opinion stands that she's crazy. Thank you guys again so much for tuning into this episode, this very, very, very important episode of VMJ Theory to celebrate Vindication Day. If you haven't already, be sure that you're subscribed and that you turn on the notifications so that you can be aware whenever I post videos, I want you guys to come in and interact with me and comment and let me know how I'm doing and if I suck, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys again and I will see you in the next one. Bye.